it and the end that God did use and that all the prophets used to delineate the God that is the holy, the unique God. Allah is nothing more than a pagan God. Uh, Secretary of Law has given an application that's the only person that can revoke them. No, we do not, Ali. I have to because Jesus loves you. I love everybody because Jesus does. But does he love me? No, he does. That's why I love Jesus because he said to put away the sword. What did Muhammad do to Christians? I'm telling you. 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 You say what you believe. And that's what we're doing now. Would you please welcome Dr. Jay Smith? Now, those pictures you saw are from Speaker's Corner. That only we do at Speaker's Corner. Don't get scared. We don't do that everywhere else, and I'm not going to do that this morning as well. That is a unique place. It's the only place on earth where we can do that. It's the only place where we can say anything we want. And believe me, we do say anything we want. Now, we do get beat up, and we do get shut down, and we do get knocked off our ladders. But it's a fascinating. I was there at Speaker's Corner for 25 years. I counted it up the other day, and that was 1,100 times I went down to that place every Sunday. It's only on Sundays. And it's the place where the Muslims love, because Muslims come from countries, come from cultures which are very oral, and they love orality. And that's the best place to learn how to be oral, how to verbalize what you want to say. But it's also a training ground. That's where we test our new material. That's the place that we go and take it for the first time. Anybody's ever heard it, they hear it there first. Because there are 10 to 1 Muslims, usually when I was there, it'd be 10 Muslims to every one Christian that was down there, you're going to get an immediate peer-reviewed. You're going to get their reaction. In fact, it's great because they create the theater for us. And it's terrific because that then we immediately put up onto YouTube. It goes up live that very day, and we find out what their response is. We see where, how they're going to react. We see where they're going to come with, and that helps us then get ready for the next salvo. So in some ways, what you saw there is unique. It only stays there. We don't do it anywhere else. It's only for London, because that's the only place there is a speaker's corner. You can't have speaker's corner in this country because you have too many guns. Whether you like it or not, that is the truth. They tried it at, in Costa Mesa. I'm sorry, um, Santa Bar now where is it, that one on the beach where they, anyhow, they're on the beach in California and people got shot. They tried it in Washington Square in New York City and people got shot. So it doesn't exist here in America, but it does in England because they have the most draconian gun laws in the world. And as a result there, we can say and get away with an awful lot of stuff that we could hear in the United States or even on a university campus. What we introduce there, we can't, I can't even introduce it on a university campus because I'll be kicked out. This is called hate speech. This is called Islamophobia. And yet, all we're asking are historical questions. So what I'm going to do this morning, I've asked Ted if this is okay, I'm going to show you exactly what, what has happened in the last two years. In the last two years, we come, we've come across some brand new material that I believe will destroy Islam. See if you agree with me. You may not. You may not agree. You may not think this is that important. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to take two services to unpack it. So this first service, and I asked Ted if this is okay. Uh, he said it was be fine. This service, I'm going to talk about Mecca and Muhammad. The next service, I'm going to talk about the Quran. Those are the three things that Islam absolutely needs. See, every Muslim, whether they are radical, whether they are nominal, whether they are liberal, is dependent on one man, one book, and one place. The man is Muhammad, the book is the Quran, and the place is Mecca, right here. Mecca. I've got this map up here because I'm going to be showing you exactly where I'm going to go. Make it as visual as possible. So I hope, I don't know if those on this side, if you might want to move over here so you can see this map, because uh, you may not be able to. We should have really put it up on the screens, but I really wanted to make it as personal as possible, and I didn't realize we'd have such a big crowd. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book, the man, and the place. Now stop and think, do we not start from the same paradigm as Christians? Do we not go to a book and a man and a place as well, don't we? 
the book would be the Bible, especially the New Testament. The man would be Jesus, and the place would be Jerusalem. Why? Because that's where he died, and that's where he rose again. So we're going to do a comparative, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this is what I did three weeks ago. Three weeks ago today, I was in London. I had to go back there. I had to go and do some filming back there, there in the studios. But whenever I'm in London, I'm with Hatun Tosh. Hatun Tosh is a lady. She's uh, from Turkey. She's only about five foot two. And she has absolutely destroyed Islam in just the last four years. She, not Islam, she has destroyed the Quran. And I'm going to talk about her more in the next hour, in the next uh, uh, service. But uh, every time, she is the one that's taken over my ministry there. She now has, goes down to Speaker's Corner every Sunday, uh, regardless of what happens. She got stabbed on June on her, in her head and in her arm at Speaker's Corner. It's all on film. You can go up on Fander Films and see what happened. She should be dead. The guy was just hammering into her with a knife on her head. Broke the blade on her head. There's no reason she should be alive today but we've got a great Lord. And she has two angels called Harry and Larry. We haven't seen them, but the Muslims see them. And they made sure she survived that attack. Oh, she had to go to the hospital, and in fact, she fell unconscious, blood all over her face when she got up there at Speaker's Corner back in June. And if you look at the video, after about 10 minutes unconscious, she finally woke up, blood was all over, she got up onto her feet, and this is what she said. Your God needs you, but my God does not need me. Kill me if you want. That's not going to stop the truth that we're talking about. You need to repent. You need to come back to Jesus Christ. Now, would you say that if you were stabbed in the head, knocked unconscious, blood streaming on your face? God gave her those words to say, what a woman, what a colleague. Can you imagine having a hundred of her on your team? Even one, this woman, in the last three years, in the last three years, after she, she'd been interviewed by different news agencies after that happened, after she got out of the hospital, and she was right back down there at Speaker's Corner the next Sunday, and the Sunday after that, and every Sunday since, including three weeks ago. But when she got out, they wanted to interview, and they asked her this question, using this methodology, which is polemics, this is all polemics, she confronts the Quran right, left, and center, and she starts with polemics, which is something you're not taught to do in any of your schools, and she ends with polemics. She goes right into mosque after mosque after mosque after mosque. She has been in 400 mosques all by herself. She's from Turkey. She desecrates our language every time she opens her mouth. God bless her. And she carries a bag with all these Qurans in it, all in Arabic. She doesn't speak a word of Arabic because she's from Turkey. And then she opens them all up and says, notice they're all different. Not one of them is the same. All in Arabic. I'll talk more about that next service. But what's fascinating about her, in just three years, she has brought a thousand Muslims to Jesus Christ all by herself. How many people do you know who have brought a thousand Muslims to Jesus Christ in just three years? Going from mosque to mosque to mosque and confronting the Muslims with their own Quran. I've never heard of this before. And yet she's my colleague. When asked, how many imams have you brought to Christ? She says, 17. 17 imams. These are men who lead Muslims in their mosques. They've all had to leave their mosques. They've all had to go find other houses around Britain. All of them are from Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Not one of them is from Turkey, which is her own home country. This is a one-woman evangelistic machine. So I was on the ladder with her three weeks ago. I was there, and I wanted to introduce this brand new material on Mecca. As we were getting up on the ladder, I was telling Ted this just before the service, as we were getting up on the ladder, she turned to me and she says, Jay, I don't agree with you on Mecca. And I said, well, please don't say anything on the ladder about that. Just run with me, bear with me. I've got to convince them, and it looks like I'm going to have to convince you as well. And this is how I started. But I don't have the pictures with me. I should have brought them. I didn't think about that. But I held up some pictures of this country right here. This is Saudi Arabia, right? But it's only been made Saudi Arabia because of the Ibn Saud family, which created Arabia, brought it together in the 1700s. They, were, they eradicated all their opposition, and they became 
Arabia, there, so they got the whole peninsula under their jurisdiction, but they needed theological, they needed theological authority, theological legitimacy. So they brought a man named Ibn al-Wahhab, Ibn al-Wahhab, who was a theologian. He was studying Ibn Taymiyyah's material in the 1700s. They brought him together, and he gave the theological legitimacy to their political entity. So you had the mosque and the state brought together much like we would have the church and state in the Catholic context. We separate the two, they bring it together. And that happened in the 1700s. So that happened 400 years ago that this whole island, or this, sorry, this peninsula came under their jurisdiction. So you had both the politics and you had the theology amalgamated. Now, that was here in Mecca, and it's also in Jeddah, and it's also in Riyadh. Those were the three centers at that time in the 1700s. What they did then is they weren't really that powerful until the last century. In the last century, they found oil here. And when they find oil here, suddenly they became a superpower. And they started transporting and forcing this Wahhabism. That's where Wahhabism comes from, from Ibn al-Wahhab, who was Muhammad Ibn al-Wahhab, who was the man that created the theology. And it all basically came down to two things. The theology of Wahhab is this. Here it is in just two sentences. To be a good Muslim, read the Quran, follow Muhammad. That's it. That's all he was saying. Read the Quran, follow Muhammad. What's the Quran? Here's the Quran. Ted, I didn't ask your permission to bring this in class. You don't mind if I bring in this building. It's already here. You can't say no. (laughs) Don't worry. We're going to destroy this in the next hour. So it'll be nothing. And that's why this is the book. This is their book. This is the Quran, right? This is the book that they follow. Every Muslim, doesn't matter whether they are radical, nominal, or liberal, they have to follow this book. Read the book. But how do you apply this book? Well, you go to the author that wrote, but it wasn't written by any author. This book is eternal. It's always been. It's never existed. It never was begun. It's always existed. Can you see the problem? Read this book. How do you apply it? Follow the man in the book. Follow the man in the book. So that's what they have been doing since the 1300s. Now, of 200 years after Ibn Taymiyyah actually created this paradigm, a man named Martin Luther did the same thing in Germany, did he not? When he nailed up his 95 thesis there in Germany, what did he say? Sola Scriptura. Read the book. Go back to Scripture. Don't follow the church. Don't follow all these traditions that are coming from the book of Tobit and these other intertestamental books. Don't follow this indulgences. We are not to have this idea called purgatory. That's not in the book. It's not in our Bible. Read the book and follow Jesus Christ. Follow the man. The book and the man. The book and the man. The book and the man. Basically, what Martin Luther was doing is what the Muslims had already done 200 years earlier. And people are still saying today, when is Islam going to be reformed? That was their reformation. He was a protester, Ibn Taymiyyah. He, people hated him. They put him into prison. He died in prison for saying, read the book and follow the man. Read the book and follow the man. Just like they hated Martin Luther. So Islam is very similar to us. As much as that's going to make you uncomfortable, don't worry. That's as far as the similarities go. Because when you read that book and follow that man, ooh, do, 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 do. What a different book and what a different man. We don't have any of, almost any of our theologies are the same. I'm not going to get into that today, but do you notice which is the bigger book? This is the bigger book, right? I make sure it's bigger just so you can say yes. (laughs) This is the bigger book. This is the smaller book. This is the bigger man. This is the smaller man. But here's the problem. When you look at the man, when you go back to Muhammad himself, you've got to go to here. Because this is where he was born, right there. Born in 570 AD, right there. The difficulty is that there is called Mecca. Now take a look at this and you'll notice, I I should have a topography map here, because if you look at a topographical map, you'll notice that it's all green up here, and it's all green down here, and it's all brown here. Why is it brown here? And what was this has been called? What did the Romans call this? What did the Greeks call this? This is known as Petraea Deserta. Deserta. Desert means desert. Right? That's all desert. That is what we know. This whole area here is 
the Mesopotamia, the places of the two rivers that come down here. See the two rivers that come down here, the Tigris and Euphrates? That is where all the civilizations occurred. Why do all the civilizations occur up here? Because it's got water. If you have a desert, you don't have any water. Am I correct? Desert means no water. If there is no water, there's no vegetation. If there's no vegetation, there are no people. If there are no people, there is no town. If there is no town, there's no cities. If there's no cities, there's no civilization. If there is no civilization, there's no history. How long did it take me to say that? Ten seconds, right? That's, if there's anything you leave from this morning, that's all you need to know. Because any Muslim, and I hope you send this to Muslims, those of you who are following this at home, I don't know where the camera is, I'm going to be pointing to there, I think it's over there. Those of you who are watching this at home, this is all going to be, it's all being recorded, it's all going up online. I want Muslims to hear this. I want all of you to tell this to your Muslim. Give them this video and have them answer this question. How could there be any history here if there's no water? Now, what, are, what do Muslims say? Every Muslim says that Adam and Eve, when they were in the Garden of Eden, now the Garden of Eden in the Quran, in chapter 2, in chapter 7, in chapter 20, the Garden of Eden is up in space. It's not on earth. Unlike our Garden of Eden, which is on earth, their Garden of Eden is up in space. So when Adam and Eve were thrown out of that garden, they were thrown down to earth. Where were they thrown down to? Bingo, right there. This is where they were thrown to. Mecca. Which means that would be the oldest town, city, civilization, civilized place on earth, right? You don't have anybody earlier than Adam and Eve. They're the first humans. Which means that should be the oldest town in history. If it's the oldest town or the oldest city, someone somewhere should have known about it or said something or written about it. We have no reference to a place called Mecca until 741 A. D. Muhammad died in 632. Can you see a problem there? That's over 100 years later before we even hear about this place. It's on no maps until 900 AD. No maps have it on it. But Ptolemy, writing in the second century, he talked all about Arabia in his, what he called the geography of Arabia. He talks about all the places, and he talks about Aden down here, and he talks about Sana, and he talks about Nazim, he talks about Taif, he talks about Yathrib, he talks about Khaibar, he talks about Tabuk, he talks about all these places, Gaza, they're all there. And you can see, they're all right here. That's the Western Plateau. Mecca is not on the Western Plateau. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. Dr. Patricia Corona in the 1980s noticed this. Or actually, in the 1970s, she noticed this. She said, hold on, it's off the Western Plateau. It's about 1,000 meters off the Western Plateau. 1,000, that's 3,000 feet. You have to go down to get to Mecca. It has no water. Why? It's a desert. It's not even an oasis. If you don't have water, how are you going to accommodate the caravans that came? How could it be on the trade route, she said. It isn't on the trade route. She reads and writes 15 languages, all archaic languages. How many of you today read and write 15 languages? So this is a real prodigy. This is a woman who's unique, one of the first in the world to actually go back to the original documents. She was head of department at Oxford University when she did her book and wrote her book in 1987 called Mecca trade in the rise of Islam. She decided to find out where this Mecca was. She went to all the documents from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way. Oh, go in this direction. Where for, for you? Yeah, where's, where's left or right? That's right. So she went all the way from second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way up until the seventh century. No reference of Mecca on any of the documents. She went all up and down the coast here. She went up all the down the coast here. She went way over here to India. She tried to find any reference, no reference. What she found was they were all talking about this place over here. Agilis, which is in Eritrea today, in Africa. That's what she found. Reference after reference, all the trade went through this way. Why? Because it went up the Red Sea. 
Why would you take all the goods coming from China and the Far East? They came to India. They could go this way because, you see, that's all mountains there. That's the Hindu Kush and the Himalayas. So they could go that way. They had to come this way. And then they had to, usually they went across here to the Persian Gulf. But then you had the Iranians, which were the Sassanids, and the Byzantines fighting each other from the 5th and 6th century. So that shut down the Persian Gulf. They had to redirect trade down to here. And they, according to the trade route theory, which is all of you who know this theory, this is what I've been taught in all my schooling, they took off the trades here in Aden and they went 1,250 miles all the way up to Gaza, stopping in Mecca, and Mecca controlled the trade. Why would you control the trade from here if the trade is down here? No one ever asked this question until she asked this question. So she went back and did, as good, any good historian should do, she went back to the documents from that time. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way up to the seventh century. And she noticed that all the trade was maritime for one very good reason. Even today, how do you send large goods anywhere? By boat, right? It's the cheapest way to send boats, by anything by boat. Even the big ships that go through there, they come from China. They come from all over the East. To get over to the Mediterranean world, they have to come this route. Because if you just put a, a, a ton of goods and you go 50 miles by land, that would cost the same amount as 1,250 miles by sea. And the reason's very simple. You go by land, you have to have camels. Camels have to be fed. Camels need to be watered. Camels need to be guarded. You need to guard your goods. That means you may be attacked from any t uh, uh, behind a rock or there might be behind a mountain or behind a sand dune. You can be attacked at any time. But when you're on the water, you can see for miles ahead. There are no sand dunes in the water. There is no mountains in the water. There is no way you can be attacked. You can see it coming. Therefore, it's much safer and it's much less expensive because all you need is wind to blow your sails. That's it. This is before diesel power. This is before gas was ever invented. They used the wind and all the trade went up this way. All the trade went this way. Why hadn't anybody noticed this before 1970? Because no one had asked that simple question. Where's Mecca? You don't ask that question in a Muslim environment and, and live very long. It's the, one, it's the one area of study where what you find may kill you. And she got a death threat for asking that question, for writing that book. Mecca and trade in the rise of Islam, she got death threats for it. From Muslims, she had to leave Oxford University, come to Cambridge University. That's where I got to know her. And when I did my first debate in 1995, look at the date. That's 26 years ago. I did my first debate on this and on the Quran and on Muhammad, the book, The Man and the Place. And she prepared my debate for me. I went to her the, day, the week before the debate, and she said, do this, write this, you say this, don't say this. And I looked at her and said, you know this material. This is your material. Why aren't you doing this debate? And she laughed at me. She said, Jay, I'm an academic. I have a chair to protect. I have an institution to represent. I cannot do this debate. But you can, because you have no chair to protect. You have no institution. You only have one person you're responsible, and his name is Jesus Christ. Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. She said that to me in 1995. She told me something I'd never heard of, I've never thought of before. We as Christians are the only ones that can debate this. We as Christians are the only ones that can ask and demand and show the Muslims that they've got a problem because this place did not exist. Look at all the historical annals. Listen, she didn't even go far enough, and this is what we just found in March of this year. As we were looking at all these, and I, was, I had my team look at all these different um, plans by Alexander the Great in the 3rd century BC, 4th century BC, sorry, 300s. He came from here. He wanted to find a waterway to get, attack Egypt. He didn't want to go across land, and he couldn't go this way because there's too many boats, and this way there's too many cities. So he wanted to see if he could go around Arabia to find a sea route to get up to here and attack Egypt that way. And the first one got to Bahrain. That's as far as it got. They went back. The second expedition got here to the Gulf of Oman. Then it went back. But the third expedition made it all the way around, and they went up the Red Sea, and then they returned home again. And the reason why they returned home is they couldn't find any provisions for their troops. So there was no food, no water for their troops. And you can't go far without food and water. So they had to return back here and they never attacked Egypt by sea. Why? Because they were going up the wrong coast. They were going up the Arabian coast. And you look and out, look at all the historical annals and you will see there is no ports here, except for one called Yanbu, right there, to accommodate Yathrib, right here. 
That is the only port that exists. But you can't accommodate an entire fleet with just one port. They had to return home. They went up the wrong coast. What they should have done is gone up this coast. Here. This coast is the western coast. This is Africa. And they have five major ports. I'm pointing them right here. Five major ports. These are the ports that have been there since the 4th century BC. Why are those ports viable and not the ones on this side? Because they have water. And where you have water, you have vegetation. And where you have vegetation, you have people. And where you have people, you have towns and towns, cities and cities, civilizations. And where there are civilizations, there are ports. It's as simple as that. Do you see how simple this is? You can all repeat this, can't you? Anytime anybody comes up to and asks, why is it nobody was over here? Why is it nobody actually did any work over here? It's because there's no water. And where there's no water, you know the rest. And that's what we found out in March of this year. Those five ports are exactly one day's boat ride away, proving that these ports have been used since the 4th century B.C. Alexander the Great was not even aware of this. He was on the wrong side of the sea. And we have just shut that down. So there was no way to get to Mecca by land. There was no way to get to Mecca by sea. Jeddah, which is there today to supply all the supplies for Mecca, was only created in, listen to the date, 750. That's the 8th century. That's just 1,400 years ago. Proving that Jeddah was created because Mecca was finally chosen. Mecca was finally chosen. Now, when we showed this and we introduced this, there's so much more I could go. It could go for about, when I, when I do a talk on this, it goes for about an hour and a half. We don't have that time. I say I only have three minutes left. That's correct. Three minutes? I've got to bring it to a stop. Can you see the problem? If you don't have Mecca, you don't any, have any reference for Mecca, all the trade routes, everything we know about this place does not exist until the 8th century. If you don't have Mecca, then you don't have Muhammad. Because where, did Muhammad, where was Muhammad born? He was born here. Where did he grow up? He was, grew up here. Where did he spend his first 50 years of his life? He spent his first 50 years of his life right here. When did the Quran get received? It was right here in Mecca, starting in the Hira cave, right outside of Mecca. Everything is dependent on Mecca. Adam and Eve were in Mecca. According to chapter 21 in the Quran, Abraham is living in Mecca. According to all the traditions, 70, as many as 70 prophets all lived here in Mecca. That means Hagar and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac were all here in Mecca. Which means we'd have to throw away all of our biblical material because everything we know about that happening is way up here. A thousand miles further north. And look at all the biblical evidence. Look at all the archaeological evidence we have for Abraham, for Isaac, for Ishmael. You name it. They're all from up here. And look at what we have for Jerusalem. We have so much evidence for Jerusalem. Not one piece of evidence for Mecca. Once you throw out Mecca, you throw out Muhammad. Once you throw out Muhammad... You throw out the Quran. No book, no man, no place. And all I did was show you a map. See how easy this is? I haven't even gone to talk about the coins yet. Or I haven't gone to talk about the inscriptions. We haven't even got into that yet. I haven't even talked about the buildings, all the kiblas, every kibla for every mosque up until 706, from way over in China, from way down in India, from all period Iran, all these kiblas, that's the direction of prayer that they're all facing, are all facing Petra. Nothing is facing Mecca, not until 727. That's over 100 years after Muhammad's death. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. And it makes my job so easy. But see, you can repeat this. Just show them a map and remind them that's a desert. If it's a desert, there's no water. If there's no water, there's no vegetation. No vegetation, no people, no people, no town, no town, no big city, no city, no civilization, no history. You cannot build an entire theology, an entire ideology, an entire religion based on desert. You've got to have civilization. You've got to have history. If there's no history, you throw out Mecca. Are you all getting it? Do you see how easy it is? By the time I finished that, after going through about an hour unpacking it at the ladder, Hatun had been converted. She was so excited about that that she came and asked me to tell her whole team on Tuesday. But more than that, if you go up on her site, DCCI, you will see she has 11 videos just on this material from what we did at Speaker's Corner. 
since the last two weeks. Now, if you want to know more about us, you can go back to the table. Judy will be back there afterwards. Here is our card. Get our card, and you have, it shows you Fander Films on the back. All of this is going up to Fander Films. If you want to keep on tap with us, if you want to see what we're now showing and what we're now doing, come and sign up on our sign-up sheet, and we will send you all the material, because this is now being taught. I'm teaching this on a master's degree level and a PhD level at Veritas International University in California. In fact, tomorrow night will be the next, the next session. I'm doing this, we're now teaching 10 different courses all on the historical critique, unpacking all this so people all over the world can get it. We have over 100 students now, and we've only been going one year. I'm also teaching it right now as we speak, this week, last week and next week in Ethiopia. I'm supposed to be there physically. That's why I wouldn't have been able to come here. I'm supposed to be in Ethiopia, but have you all been hearing what's happening in Ethiopia? You need to pray for Ethiopia. Addis Ababa may soon fall. Addis Ababa is being attacked from the north by the Tigrays, from the south by the Omorals. They want to take over Addis Ababa and make it an Islamic state. These are two Muslim pincher movements that are coming. All my students had to leave the city. They're back in their own, uh, or their own towns. This is a master's degree course that we're teaching there. This material we're teaching there in Ethiopia because these are all pastors getting master's degree and they all want this material because they are surrounded by Islam on all four sides. They are the only Christian country in the world that has retained their Christian identity for 2,000 years. The church in, uh, in Ethiopia, the Orthodox Church, numbers 42 million. If Islam takes over Addis Ababa in the next few weeks, Ethiopia will fall. You need to pray for Ethiopia. It's happening and no one's talking about it here. Because all we want to talk about is Trump and Biden. We need to start talking about what's happening around the rest of the world, especially to our church. Let's pray for Ethiopia, pray for these pastors as we're introducing. They want this material because this is not hate speech. This is not Islamophobia. This is historical. You're right. I am a polemicist to go on the offense. Apologist means to go on the defense. And all of you can be apologists because... What apologetics is, is basically defending the person of Jesus Christ and defending the Bible. That's it. The book of the man, the book of the man. That's all you are asked to do. And that's exactly what the early church did, and that's exactly what Paul did, and all the disciples did. Jesus did that. Polemics is to go the other direction. It's like a football team. You have your offense and you have your defense. You have two completely different teams, don't you? And they have two completely different skills. And the defense, those of you who are all Eagle fans, I'm sure you are, shame on you if you're not, you all have your defensive team. They're big guys, they're bruisers, and they make sure the others don't score against you. Otherwise, you lose the game. But they don't, they don't win the game. The ones that win the game are the offensive team. And the offense have a totally different set of skills. They are the ones that run, they grab, and then they push and get themselves to the other goal. And they are the ones that score, and their names are all over the papers, and you know them best, and they get the highest salaries. Why? Because they win the game. So where and what do we do in offense in Christianity? We don't. Not against Islam. Oh, you have offense against the Jehovah Witnesses, you have offense against the Mormons, you have offense, in fact, I did my first degree in apologetics, my first master's was in apologetics, but that was all against the humanists and the atheists, you name it, but never, 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 no, no offense against Muslims. There is no school in the world that teaches it except ours. We're the first school to do that. Veritas International University in California, where I have a master's degree program, in fact, we are the first master's degree anywhere in the world on both apologetics and polemics to Islam. Words you probably never heard of before, because we don't teach that, not in biblical studies. And so we're the first one to start this up, because if you're going to take on Islam, you've got to win the goal. You've got to make the touchdown. You've got to shut down Islam. Now, these are fighting words for a brethren in Christ missionary to be speaking. We're supposed to be peace and reconciliation, right? Isn't that what we all talk about? Where does Christ ever talk about peace and reconciliation with the enemy? Does he? Can you show me one verse where he talks about peace and reconciliation with Satan? With any other religion besides Christianity? Can you show me where in the church Paul ever had peace and reconciliation with the Stoics or with the Epicureans or with the Gentiles and certainly not with the Pharisees? Every place he went into, Laodicea, Cappadocia, Berea, wherever he went, he went right into the synagogue and he confronted these Pharisees with what they had done to the Messiah. That's called polemics. That's polemics, folks. 
You cannot open the book of Acts and read chapter 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 without seeing polemics all the way through it. And he got beat up, and he got thrown into prison, and he got flogged, and he twice they tried to stone him to death. He caused a riot in Ephesus, and they finally killed him in Rome. For peace and reconciliation? Yet that's all we preach. Peace and reconciliation. I'm stepping on some of your toes, aren't I? This is not, like the, this is not what you like to hear in the brethren in Christ. And that's exactly what Paul did. It's what Jesus Christ did when he was there in the temple, overturning the table. That's polemics. Look at Matthew 23, the entire chapter. You hypocrites, you den of vipers, you white sepulchers, the entire chapter is full of polemics. Why aren't we doing that today? Because we're so fearful of Islam. We are scared to death of Muslims. Am I correct? The only people who are willing to come with me are the Afro-Americans and the Afro-Caribbeans and the Africans. That's why I have to go to Nigeria and I'm in Ethiopia right now. Every day I'm supposed to be there physically. I'm training them up because they're surrounded by Islam. Look at Ethiopia. See what's happening right now this week. The Tigrayans, Muslims, are coming from the north, coming down to Addis Ababa. The Omoros are coming from the south to Addis Ababa, a pincher moving. Have you been following this in the news? No, no one talks about it here in America because all you want to talk about is Biden and all you want to talk about is Trump. You don't want to say anything about what's happening in the rest of the world. We're watching Ethiopia in just a few weeks maybe overridden by Islam. It is surrounded by Islam. This is the only country that for 2,000 years has remained Christian. That's true. No other country has a majority population that's Christian for 2,000 years. 60% of the population of Ethiopia is Christian. The Orthodox Church in Ethiopia has 42 million members. And yet we're not even looking at the news. We're not even aware of what's happening. I'm training up 20 pastors right now, all at a master's degree level, trying to introduce all this new material because they need it more than you need it. They need it because they need to go on the offense. They need to shut down Islam. They can't even stay in Addis. They've been told all to go home because of everything that's happening. It's going to fall. And so they're doing it with their laptops in all their different cities. And we're every morning now, I'm training them up for two and a half hours into this material. I should be there physically, but I can't because it's too dangerous right now. And this is what I'm telling them. In the first service, I talked about Mecca, and I just destroyed Mecca. We now have destroyed Mecca historically. And it's as simple as saying one word, two words. No water. That's all you have to say. No water. Here's Mecca right here. This is where Adam and Eve were sent to. This is where Abraham lived in chapter 21 of the Quran. Adam and Eve were sent down to Mecca in chapter 7, verse, 20, uh, verse 27. Look in the Quran. It's right there in the Quran. Just read it in black and white. Abraham was there in the Kaaba. He goes and he destroys all the idols and with a big idol, and then the next day is thrown into a fiery pit, and then God saves him from the fiery pit. Well, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nonetheless, the story is with Abraham here in Mecca, which means Mecca should have been there from the very beginning because you don't get anybody earlier than Adam and Eve. They are the first, right? That's in the Quran. Well, we shut that down just by asking two words. There's no water. There's no water anywhere here. If there's no water, there's no vegetation. If there's no vegetation, there are no people. If there are no people, there are no towns. If there's no towns, there's no cities. If there are no cities, there is no civilization. If there is no civilization, there is no history. Bingo, shut down Mecca, just like that. And it took me 10 seconds. That's just what you can do. Just ask any Muslim, show me any historical record for Mecca prior to 741, that's the 8th century. Nothing at all about this place called Mecca. See, without Mecca, if Mecca doesn't exist, and it hasn't exist, in fact, it was invented, it was created in the 8th century, 100 years after Muhammad died, in 632, they finally created Mecca. And so the first record we have of Mecca is 741. The first time it's even on any map anywhere, in any place, is not till 980, that's the 10th century. If you don't have Mecca, you don't have Muhammad. If you don't have Muhammad, you don't have the Quran, this book right here. And what I want to do this hour, I want to look at this book. I've asked Ted, he said it's okay to bring this into church, it's not going to hurt anybody because we're going to destroy it right now. This is the book that every Muslim has to follow. Why? Because this book is eternal. According to chapter 85, verse 22 in the Quran, this book was never created. It is the eternal tablet that has always existed, coexisted with God, which is already, Ted, that's a duality, isn't it? 
How can you have something, an animate object, coexist with God if God is eternal and you have another, co- a tablet eternal? Defend that. Who have any Muslim? I've asked that for 40 years. No Muslim has been able to defend. Nonetheless, this has never been touched by human hands. If it's eternal, it is the word of God, definite article, because it is above mankind. No man can touch it. No man can change it. That's in chapter 10, verse 15. That's in chapter 18, verse 27. And that's also in chapter 15, verse 9. Why? Because in 15, verse 9, the reason no man can touch it, that means no man can change one word, no man can change one letter, is because Allah guards it. Chapter 15, verse 9 in the Quran. It's all through the Quran. This book says clearly there's only one God, and he has no associates. That's in chapter 5, verse 72. There's only one God, and he has no wife. That's chapter 6, verse 101. Say not three, for God is one, and he has no son. That's in chapter 4, verse 171. And verse after verse after verse confronts Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 75, it says very clearly that man, God, cannot eat, yet Jesus ate. In chapter 5, verse 116, it says, Is it true, you, Jesus, Issa, that you and your mother are worshipped as gods, supposing and insinuating that Mary is part of the Trinity? Do you teach that here? Please don't say yes. Thank you. You said no. Boy, you got your theology right. We don't teach Mary as part of the Trinity, but it's in the Quran, which suggests there's something wrong with this book because it doesn't even understand who Jesus is. Chapter 4, verse 157. For they killed him not, they thought it was so, another was given his place. Another was given his image. That's Jesus Christ. They killed him not, they did not crucify him. That's in chapter 4, verse 157. And if that is true, then we're all damned, folks. You might as well all go home. If Jesus Christ did not die on the cross and rise again on the third day, we're all damned. And this book damns us all to hell. That's this book which means we're going to have to confront this book. Stop confronting Muslims. You're wasting your time. That's called hate speech. Don't say anything nasty to Muslims. Don't even talk about Muhammad. Stop this talking about his sexual proclivities and his violence. Forget it. Don't do that. I'm going to show you what you need to do. And this is real polemics. Just confront this book. Confront this book. Because when you confront this book, you confront the man with him. It goes simultaneously. Confront this book and confront that place. place. The book, the man, and the place. Ooh, I love this. And here's how you do it. So ask your Muslim friend, the next time they say that this book is eternal, never been changed, not one word, not one letter, that has never, it has always existed, coexistent with God, eternally, and therefore no man can touch it. It was sent down to a man named Muhammad from 610 to 632, that 22-year period, first in Mecca. Ooh, wait a minute, there is no Mecca, so how could he receive it here? You've already eradicated that in the last hour. If it doesn't exist here, there's no Quran there, right? Well, then just take the Quran and tear Don't do it, please. Don't do that. Tear it in half and throw that part half away because that is all from Mecca. Then he moves to this place up here, Medina, which is called Yathrib at that time. And we're going to confront that now because if that was the case, there should be a Quran somewhere in this area, right? There should be a Quran at the 7th century because it was canonized by Uthman in 652. That's mid-7th century. So 1,400 years ago, there was a Quran here. But it wasn't just one Quran because suddenly they realized there was more than one Quran. So what did Uthman do in 652? He then took all the other Qurans that were in different languages. He burned them all and only had one Quran left known as the Qurayshi Quran, which is this Quran. So I'm told. This is the Quran that every Muslim reads all over the world, right? Say yes. Be good Muslims, you're to be obedient and submissive, submissive, that's what Islam means, so be good Muslims just for the next half hour, okay? At least you be a good Muslim, okay? Just say yes to everything I say. You're going to be Abdul, all right? You're my Abdul. And you're going to be Amina, okay? Amina and Abdul. So Abdul, this is your book, right? Just say yes. Yes, sir. And this is the book you've had since 1400, since 652. Say yes. Eternal. Not one word, not one letter. And you've been telling me this for 40 years. We've been good friends, haven't we, Abdul? And though I just met you today. <laughs> and yet you've been telling me for 40 years, not one word, not one letter. If that was the case, have you seen what Hatun found? Who's Hatun? Hatun is a five foot, two inch girl. She's only this high. She's from Turkey. And she is a daughter of an imam, a well-known imam in Turkey. She had to leave Turkey because she became a Christian. And... I won't tell you the whole story. I'm not permitted to tell you the whole story, but it is absolutely horrendous, horrendous when you hear her story. She had to be thrown. She had to leave Turkey, had to come to Britain, became my student, 
she thought I was audacious. She thought I was arrogant the first time she met me because I come across as arrogant all the time. Ask my wife. And so here she was. She was my student, and I was said I went to a place called Speaker's Corner every Sunday. She came down to Speaker's Corner. That's what you saw up there on the, on the, uh, on the screen. That's what I did for 20, 1,100 times I was at Speaker's Corner over 25 years, going there week after week. Those guys that you see there, you saw Adnan Rashid. You probably didn't know him. He is one of the top Muslim debaters in the world today. He has a following of half a million all over the world on YouTube. You also saw Ishmael. Ishmael was there as well, the first guy at the very beginning. He is well known all over Europe. He is one of their best debaters. And we shut them down using Hattun's material. What did Hattun find? Hattun, who had grown up as an imam's daughter, had always been told that the Quran is eternal, that it has never been changed, not one word, not one letter has ever been changed. She went to Morocco to teach some missionaries there and she wanted to get a Quran in Arabic. She doesn't speak a, a word of Arabic herself. She went into the bookstore and she said, could you please give me one Quran? The man behind the counter said, well, which Quran do you want? She said, what do you mean, which Quran? She said, I want the Quran. There's only one Quran. She says, no, over here we have Warsh, we have Hafs, we have al Qasai, we have Ibn Kafir. And she said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? He says, what do you mean? You haven't heard about these different Qurans? He says, which one do you memorize? Do you memorize Hafs? Do you memorize Warsh? Do you have memorized Kasai? Here's Kaloon over here. She said, well, give me them all. And so she brought them back to London to show me. This is back in 2013. And I started laughing when I saw these. I said, I had no idea these Qurans still existed because these are over a thousand year old. This, is what, this happened way back in the 8th, 9th, and the 10th century when all of a sudden they started writing these many different Qurans because these are the first Qurans that existed. And when they looked at the text, they, all you have are just little squiggly letters. If you look at Arabic, it doesn't, at the very beginning it had no dots, it had no vowels. It just had what we call as cardinal text or skeletal text. These are called the razm. It's a great word to remember. Rizm, it just, it just uh, kind of bleh, just drips out of your mouth. Rizm, I love. Oh, there goes my spit. Now the rest. So here you have rizm, and that's all they had. Just basically 16 letters, but nobody could read them because one little smiley face like this could be five different letters. So they had to start adding dots to them. You put one dot above it becomes a na. You put one, two dots above it becomes a ta. Three dots above it becomes a tha. One dot below it becomes a ba. Two dots below it becomes a ya. Na, ta, tha, ba, ya. Five letters, just depending on where your dots. So suddenly I'm with all these dots at their disposal, but then they don't have any vowels, so you have to add three vowels. If you put a little slash above it, it becomes a fatta, which is a ah sound. If you put a little curly cube above it, it becomes a, a dhamma, which is a oo sound. If you put one little slash below it, it becomes a kasra, which is a e, a, u, e, right? Three vowels in Arabic. And now instead of 16 letters, you now have 28 letters. Well, if you have 28 letters to deal with, you're, you're going to be, Abdul, putting your dots where you want to. Amina, you're going to put your dots where you want to. You will put your dots where you want to. You will stick your dots where you want to. And you will call yours Abdul. And you will call yours Amina. And you will call yours Warsh. And you will call yours Kaloon. So you give your name to your Quran. And suddenly all these Qurans start proliferating. 700 Qurans by the 10th century. 700 different Qurans. All with different dots all over the place. All saying different things. Because if you take three letters together and put dots in different places, you can get anywhere from 19 to 33 different words. That's just with one word. And you have a sentence of different words. You can have all kinds of sentences. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Have any of you heard this before? No. And you never would have heard this had it not been for Hattun, five foot two inches. She went and found these six and came back, and I said, well, there's actually quite a few more than this. Try finding 30 of them, because there's 30 official ones that were made official by 1429. That's a 15th century. 800 years after Muhammad, they had chosen 30 that were official. 30 different Qurans. So she started going all over the place. She started going to Yemen, to Jordan. She went, anybody that was traveling, she said, could you get this one for me? Could you get this one? Because I gave her the whole list. You can see the list. It's up on Wikipedia. It's all there if you want to read it. I'm not telling you anything that Wikipedia hasn't already said. We've known about it, but no Muslim knew about it. Well, not no Muslim. No one on the ground knew about it. And then she found 26 of them. So we took them down to Speaker's Corner that you saw up on the screen in 2016, six years ago. No, five years ago. I don't know my math. You can ask my wife. Five years ago, we took them to Speaker's Corner and we held them up so the whole world could see. Or the Muslims went berserk. 
They start throwing things at us. A big, tall Muslim named Muhammad Hijab, who is well-known all over the Muslim world now, he has a following of half a million. He said, he was sitting there, right there, standing at the foot of our ladder. You can see him on the video. Just go up on Fander Films, so our film, my YouTube channel. Watch to see what he does. He goes outside of the group. And he says, all the Muslims, come here, come here. Do not look at what they're showing you. Do not listen to a word they're saying. I will tell you everything. Well, that was in 2016. Last year in 2020, four years later, he went to the leading scholar in the Muslim world called Yasser, Dr. Yasser Qadi out of Houston, Texas, got his PhD at Yale University on the Quran on this very subject. It's called the Kirat and the Ahruf. And at Yale University, he had a crisis of faith. You see, at Yale University, they ask any question they want. When you go to the Muslim world, they put red lines. This is what he said when Muhammad Hijab, he said, Muhammad Hijab is in the interview there on July 8, 2020. He says, I have a, my hand here. It is blank. Which Quran are you going to write on my blank hand? Is it Hafs? Is it Warsh? Is it Galun? Is it Kisa? And before he could finish his sentence, Yasser Qadi says, do not ask me this question. We do not talk about this in public. Do not film me. And we're all watching this live. I'm sitting there looking at it, and I'm starting to go like this. Well done, we've got an honest Muslim finally. And he says, we have a red line in Islam. We don't ask certain questions. We have a respect for the Quran. We don't go beyond certain questions. But at Yale University, there's no red line. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You can ask any question you want at Yale University, because that's the West. That's where they're asking questions about our Bible. See, these questions we know about, don't we, Ted? We've, you've had these questions, haven't you, about the Bible? Is there such a person as Moses? Did he write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? What about the documentary hypothesis, the JEDP? We've had these questions. You had to learn them. I had to learn them in seminary. These, these questions have all been asked of the Bible, and we've answered every one of these questions. Redacted criticism, source criticism. This is called textual criticism. Historical criticism. These were all asked in the, there in the 1800s in Germany at the Tübingen School, Wellhausen. We're well aware of these type of criticisms, and we've answered every one of those criticisms. If you have any doubt, go get Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It answers every one of those questions. The Bible has passed every test. It didn't invent these, these areas of study. It matured them. So that every other literature, piece of literature, could be asked this question, including the Quran. So we did that. That was in 2016. Because of what Hatun showed the world, because of that interview that happened just a year ago, year and a half ago, as Yasser Qadi was going on, he, he said, you in the East, pointing to Muhammad Hijab, you, don't, you have a real problem. The standard is narrative, which is your narrative, has holes in it. He admitted this to the whole world. In the West, he says, where I live, in Yale University, we, we, the, the, the intellects, the Western world has come leaps and bounds in the last hundred years. And we've got to live in this world. You don't have to live in this world because you have holes in your narrative. Finally, after 28 minutes, Muhammad Hijab put his hand out a second time. He said, I still want an answer. Which Quran? Which is the Quran that's eternal? Which is the Quran that's in heaven? Which is the one of these 30 that is the one that was revealed to Muhammad? Which is the one that was canonized by Uthman? Yasser Qadi had to come up with an answer. He finally said, they're all the Quran. Ooh, all 30 of them. You take a little bit of this, you take a little bit of that, you take a little bit of these dots and those vowels and these dots and those vowels, you just mix them up and that's the Quran. And I just started clapping. See, what Yasser Qadi doesn't know is what we know. See, no Muslim has done what we've done. Our team has gone back, and we started to look at them. We have a team in Australia. We have a team in Britain, and my team here that's all over the world. We're now looking. Here are two of those Qurans. These are the two most popular Qurans in the world today. This one, I've got it upside down. Let's put it right side up so you can read. I know you can all read Arabic, so you, you want to make sure I have it right side up. This is Huff's. This is now memorized by 95% of the Muslims in the world today, Hafs. This man, Hafs, that's his name, he was one that wrote this Quran. He wrote this in 796. Muhammad died in 632. That's 146 af years after Muhammad, he wrote this book. He did not write this book in Arabia because this down here, the Arabic that's in this book does not come from here. The Arabic that's in this book comes from this part of the world. 
Well, why does it come from this part of the world? Well, because there's water up here. And where there's water, there's vegetation. And where there's vegetation, there are people. And when there are people, there are towns and there are cities. And there, are stuff. and there is written text. This is known as Nabataean Aramaic. This text, this Quran Arabic, that's in this book, which is in the Quran today, because this is the Quran, the official Quran, that was chosen in 1924. Let me repeat that. 1924, that's not even 100 years ago. That's 97 years ago. This was chosen as the official text. Have none of you heard this before? See, no Muslims. Abdul, you never heard this either. What does this do to your Quran? This is a man-made book. Written by a man who lived in, not in Arabia, he lived way over here in Kufa, which is just southwest of Baghdad. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. And this, you say, is eternal? What about this one here? This is Warsh. This is memorized all over North Africa. Why? Because it comes from Cairo, way up here in Egypt. It was written in 812. Just between these two books, Abdul, are you listening to Amina, the two of you? When you go home, you can talk about it, and you can ask whether or not you really want to follow this book anymore. Just between these two books, there are 5,000 different words, which means 5,000 different sentences, which means 5,000 different meanings, which means this is as human-made as you can get. This has nothing to do with God, and we can throw it away. It gets even better than that. Because, see, then these two books have just come out, these two books have just come out in the last 10 years, actually 20 years. And this one I had something to do with. This is from the German school. The Germans have finally now started to look at the Quran, and they're going and taking all the dots away and taking all the vowels away. And guess what they're finding? They're going back to the Razum. They're going back to the skeletal text. But they don't want you to know this because this is not in English. This is all in German. And what they have found, these are Syriac scholars. One is named Dr. Christian, Christoph Luxemburg. The other one is named Dr. Gunther Lulling. Dr. Christian Luxemburg, I'm sorry, Dr. Lung, uh, Christoph L Dr. Gunther Luling, sorry, is a good friend of mine. I know him personally. I've been to his home. I actually helped translate this book. I didn't do the translation. I commissioned it to get translated, and I got it and translated. This is his doctoral thesis. He went and took off all the dots and just looked at the skeletal text, which is what you should do, isn't that right, as a textual critic? You go back to the original text. Am I correct, Abdul? No, you wouldn't know this, but he does. You know this, isn't it? See, as a Christian, we do this with the Bible, don't we? We go back to the Greek text, right? Not the Latin Vulgate. We go back to the Greek text, the Sinaiticus, the Alexandrinus, the Vaticanus. That's the, the original. Well, it's not the original, but it's the closest to the original. So he went back to the closest to the original, and guess what he found? When you take off all the dots, when you take off the vowels, and you just go back to the text, he found out that this is not to do with Arabic anyways. This is Syriac... Ooh, Aramaic. The original text is Syriac Aramaic, which is the theological language of the Byzantine Christians from the 5th, 6th, and 7th century. And it turns out, when he looked at all these beautiful poetry that's in the Quran, about 30% of the Quran is made up of poetry. Guess what he found? Every one of those poems, strophe for strophe, line for line, are Christian hymns written in Christian Syriac, Aramaic, in the 5th and 6th century, taken and ripped out of the Aramaic, and then put into Arabic, which only started to exist in the 7th century, started adding the dots and vowels, and almost all of them are about Jesus Christ. They're all about Jesus. Christian hymns, like what we are singing today, written in Syriac, and then introduced and eradicated much of his theology, destroyed by the Arabic in the 8th century. Christoph Luxemburg did the same thing with the rest of the Quran. The dark passages, 25% of the Quran, even the Muslim scholars don't understand today. So he was curious, so he's a, a scholar of Aramaic, he's taught at it, and when he went back and ripped all the dots out and ripped all the vowels out, and then he went back to the lexicon and he reintroduced it in Syriac, he was able to find every one of those references to God, the biblical stories, he could go back and source every one of them. And most of them are what we know today as Christian lectionaries written in the 5th and 6th century for liturgy in the church, all praising Jesus. That's just been found in the last few years. We're just now introducing that on my YouTube site this week, coming out of the German school, because we can't read German, so we're getting German scholars to translate it for us. Can you see what I've just done to the Quran? Not only is this book the Quran, 
a book written by men. It was first written by Christians. Taken out of its Christian environment, interposed with Arabic teaching, eradicated, and what they have done to the Quran. What they see, the Quran really is the Kariyana. Kariyana is the name for the recitation in Syriac. Quran means recitation in Arabic. They've taken the lectionaries, the Kariyana, and put it into the Quran, Arabic, and they eradicated all the references to Jesus and put instead the prophet of God, the plagued one of God, and four times they even referred to him as Muhammad. But what does Muhammad mean in Arabic? It means the praised one. This is not a name, this is a title, referring to Jesus Christ. Now, can you see what this does to the Quran? Are you following me? I know it's a little difficult, especially for you. I mean, Eliza, but I'm not sure if you do, Abdul. You can ask your wife when you get home. Can you see what's going on here? I'm destroying the Quran, and all I'm doing is textual criticism. Taking a book, all of it written up here, where all the people live, where all the civilizations are, where Christianity flourished, Judaism flourished, taking it away from here and putting it up here. And what we're now doing is we're destroying the Quran, and we need to bring it home. We need to bring it back to its original text, back to Jesus Christ. That's my job. That's not your job. Let us, the polemicists, do that. You just defend Jesus. You just defend the Bible. Let us confront the Quran. Let us confront Muhammad. And let us confront Mecca. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for what you're doing. We want to thank you, Lord, that we can worship you. Lord, we want to ask you that as we continue to confront the Quran, as we continue to confront Muhammad, and as we continue to confront Mecca, these are the things that are going to, that are going to shut down Islam. In everything we do, may we represent you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now before I go, I just want to say real quickly, if you do want to know more, we have a book table back there. My wife, Judy, will be there. Uh, we have these cards, and this is where you can find Fander Films. Fander Films, all this new material is going up on Fander Films almost every other day. And we're putting up all this brand new material that I just introduced you today. You're the first to hear it. It's all going up in the Fander Films. If you want to get on our prayer letters where we're introducing all this and keep in touch with us, there is a sign-up sheet out there, but make sure when you write your email that I can, or that Judy can read it, okay? Because uh, if you can't read it, we're not going to get it to you. But do come and join us. Do continue to support us. Thank God for your support, and thanks so much for keeping, because we can't do what we're doing unless you continue to support us, because we're faith missionaries. But we're great to be on your team. It's so nice to be back at Palmyra. God bless you until next time.